Well, hello, everybody. It's raining in the Adirondacks, and it is raining hard. I don't know if it's left over from the hurricane or what it is, but it. I was going to go painting today, and it's cold and rainy, and if you hear noise in the background, that's the rain on the roof. You can see it's a little darker in here today. I have a guest. My guest is a world-famous, world-renowned painter. His name is Thomas Kegler. Welcome, Thomas. Hello, Eric. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Yeah, it's a we're nicer here. We're actually not that far west of you here in New York, and uh, the sun's shining. Yeah, well, let's hope that it uh, the sun will be shining because today's my painting day, good, and good. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to show you guys uh, when when we get to it in a minute. I'm going to show you guys what I use to paint outdoors in the rain because rain is the best time to paint. One of the best times to paint because you get all this atmosphere. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about some things with atmosphere today, but it's a really great time. And uh, so I love to paint in the rain, except I don't want rain running down my painting, although I have done that. So Thomas, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Um, where are you? You're in you're in upstate New York. Where? Uh, I'm over near Buffalo, actually closer to Toronto than New York City. Um, uh, I'm a high school art teacher and a professional painter. I I feel very fortunate. I'm raising two amazing kids and uh, able to do things that I absolutely love, which is teach and paint. And, You're a single uh, dad, right? I'm a single dad. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, my wife passed away a few years back um, and we're blessed with um, a lot of things from that. It was it was obviously a very uh, trying experience. And uh, but I think those those trying experiences in life, a lot of times they uh, they will bring out the best in you. Uh, and I, I, I trust in that. And I put my trust in God. And and then from that, I've been very much blessed. My kids are doing amazing. I'm doing it really well. And uh, and again, I'm, I'm able to do things I absolutely love, which is to teach and share things that I'm passionate about um, with not only my kids, but obviously my students and uh, and to, to explore and, and paint God's wonders in, in the form of landscapes. So I want to show you guys just quickly before we drop off and, and I make my announcements. This is this painting. Thomas, how big is this painting? Uh, this painting is eight foot wide and about 32 inches high. Uh, it's eight, a, eight, eight foot wide. And, and how long did that painting take you? Well, because I created, the intent of this was to create an instructional video when I did the painting. Uh, so, you know, there were times where I had five cameras rolling at the same time while I was painting and I was doing a lot of the shots myself. So I would have to pause and move it. So that, that's a long answer to your story. It took probably five times longer than it should have. Uh, it, it took about six months from, you know, the brush first hitting the canvas to the, to the actual finish of it. Uh, the, the video that was produced through that is about nine hours long uh, and it shows pretty much every aspect of the creation of a large studio painting that is based on plein air work. So I actually show all the steps, including on-site sketching, plein air painting, um, all the way through the concepting to the finished piece. And there is about a half hour, 45 minute segment on the creation and making of the frame itself, which was custom made. You know, it, it, uh, the, the video is phenomenal because it, Thank you. it, it has so many, you know, most, most of the videos that we do would be about painting a particular subject. And, and this one was also, you know, it's called painting Niagara. So you would get the idea that it's about painting a waterfall. But the reality is that, you know, there's so many different techniques in that particular video. You know, it's about the the atmosphere. It's about the, the sky, the clouds, the trees, the rocks, the light, the water. I mean, there's just so many different things that, that came out of that. And so we'll talk about that more today. Mm -hmm. And and we're going to, what are you going to do for us today? Well, um, when you asked me to do the demo, I, I wanted to somehow tie it in with the video, but also keep it uh, current to what I'm visioning right now. So uh, make a long story short, my kids and I just got back from a life changing trip out to Yellowstone. And one of the things I came back from that trip was a, a lifetime's worth of ideas. And I got lots of sketches and, and some a plethora of photos, obviously, which um, will help uh, direct a lot of the, the concepts. But um, I started working on a couple of old faithful studies here in the studio. 
And mm -hmm. I think there's obviously a tie in with the painting video because I can talk about the aspects of water um, from, you know, when it comes to a waterfall, it's cascading down, but in a, a spout, as in Old Faithful, it's going up. But there's also a phenomenon of it coming down as well as the, uh, the rising mist um, and the vapors. And we can talk a lot about that in the demo. So I've got a painting here, it's about halfway done. And I'll go to the next layer when we get to that point. Yeah, and we're going to show some of your sketches and so on as well. And so um, I'll tell you what, I'll be back in just a minute. Okay. I'm going to take you off camera for a second. And then uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. And I'm anxious to see it because I struggle with painting waterfalls. Okay. And I, and, and I struggle with painting mist and making it look right. And, and so I'm very curious about this. So that'll be really terrific. Great. Thank you. All right, today is day number, let's see, today is day number 157 live. That means we have been here every day. Uh, we started this about a week after coronavirus quarantine started, but we every day now for 157 days, we have been here live. And the goal is to give you uh, something to keep you focused on, on art or learning art or discovering art. Uh, or getting to the next level, we have uh, we produce and have uh, four or five hundred videos that we have produced, and so we've been giving you video segments every day. Some of the content that we have created, and uh, giving you uh, some really terrific videos, so that you have a feel for uh, how to paint. And uh, we're giving you so you know about an hour, sometimes more. So today is going to be a really special day because we have. Uh, Mario Robinson is going to be doing beginner watercolor portraits. So I am anxious. I haven't seen this one yet, and I am anxious to see it because I was doing watercolor portraits just uh, two nights ago. I was sitting in front of the television and doing quick sketches, watercolor sketches of people on TV. And there were people doing speeches, so they were there for five or six minutes. So I was doing these quick sketches. And so uh, I'm anxious to see this, but this is a brand new video that is just being released. And it's Mario Robinson, Beginner Watercolor Portraits. What you're going to find is, is so wonderful about Mario is that he, um, he tells stories with his paintings. And so the paintings are not just your typical straight on portrait. I mean, sometimes they will, but, but he's really good at capturing mood and this is the model uh, and this is the painting. And so it's a really interesting composition, really creates mood and it's telling a story. You know, it's why is that that uh, pencil sharpener there? What's what's the story with the shelf and so on? So uh, Mario is going to be on at three o'clock today. And the way to find that is on Streamline Art Video at YouTube or Facebook. So the way to do that is you go to either of those platforms and you type in Streamline Art Video in the in the search, and you'll be able to find it. And every day at 3 p.m., we have one. So you want to subscribe to uh, Facebook so it pops up when it goes live, or you want to subscribe to YouTube so it pops up and notifies you when it goes live. And so that's something that you can do that will help you. We've got, I don't know, 65,000 people are subscribing now. And so we've had um, on day, this is day 157, by day... 29, I believe, maybe day 22, we had over 1.7 million views on the various platforms. And so we really have had a chance to touch the world. And, and uh, I have no idea how many views since then. I haven't really had our people look it up, but it's, it's huge. And uh, we are getting views from all over the world. And that's really been wonderful because we're able to reach out and touch new people and uh, and help them discover or learn art. If you're watching this for the first time, you can paint. I believe, and, and by the way, I publish uh, Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air magazines. I also publish Realism Today, Watercolor, American Watercolor, uh, Plein Air Today, um, what else? Fine Art Today, newsletters, and I put on the Figurative Art Convention and Expo and the uh, Plein Air Convention. Plus, I did uh, Plein Air Live and Realism Live. I, I don't mean I, we, our organization. And, and so we know art, and we have great relationships with the very top artists. We only select the best. There's a lot of people that we pass on because uh, we want 
the people who are not only the best painters, but also the best teachers. And so you will find the best of the best in the Streamline group of companies, which is Streamline Art Video, Lil It All, Art Video, and Creative Catalyst. And so we've got lots of video for you to see. And uh, so anyway, check it out at 3 p.m. Uh, today, and, and you'll really enjoy it. I think Mario is such a great teacher. You're going to have a lot of fun with this. Last night, uh, last night we did my cocktail hour for the people who have been members of Plein Air Live. Now, about three, four weeks ago, we did Plein Air Live, which was a virtual uh, conference online about Plein Air painting. We started out with a beginner day to teach beginners how to do things from the basics, and then uh, four days of the world's top instructors in Plein Air painting. And I, I won't mention names now because there's so many, and I'm grateful for them all. And people said it was like, a, you know, a um, fire hose into a teacup of information. Well, what we did is every day uh, during Plein Air Live, we would do these cocktail hours at the end of the day. We also did breakout rooms so people could get to know people because we had attendees from 30 or 40 countries all over the world. And we had instructors from all over the world. So uh, anyway, because those people are now a member of that, they have access to a private uh, Facebook group so they can continue to interact and develop their relationships over time. And once in a while, I told them we would do a cocktail hour. Uh, so last night we did a cocktail hour. I had it scheduled for one hour. We ended up at a, about two, two hours or something like that. The other thing we did yesterday, is, which was really a lot of fun, is uh, we did our first mastermind. Uh, the VIP members of the uh, of the Realism Live group were invited to the first mastermind I've ever done. And a mastermind is where you combine the minds of all the people to come up with answers for your problems and solutions. And we worked, uh, We again, we had a, a two-hour session scheduled. We ended up at almost four hours and people were begging for more. We just had so much fun really digging into people's art careers and how to help them at, with their specific problems and needs. What was fascinating to me is that uh, we started out, I'd ask them to state their problem in a very brief way, and then I would probe and try to find out more about it. And almost every single one thought that their goals were something. And then as we probed and really got into it, we realized and helped them identify that their goals were completely different than what they thought they were. And so uh, we did what we call hot seats, where people will will uh, put themselves out there and reveal themselves and and we we made it confidential nobody else gets to see it except people in the VIP group and it was absolutely life changing for me but it was life changing for them too me, life changing for me because I've never done one before I'm a member of several mastermind groups but never have done one myself and it, it was phenomenal it was so phenomenal I'm I'm encouraged to maybe think about doing them more so that was going on yesterday. Um, I want to tell you about what's going on now in terms of timing, because uh, we are at, today is August 29th, and tomorrow is the 30th, right? So the 30th is not only my, my birthday, but it's also the end of your chance to enter to win Plen Air Salon, or actually the 31st for that one. Uh, you enter any painting that you have in any category. It doesn't have to be a plein air painting. We have a plein air category, but we also have studio categories. We have lots of different categories such as you know, still life and landscape and floral and water and so on. And so there's 20 or so categories. If you win uh, the top three, uh, you get prizes every month. But if you win in any category, you're entered into the national competition for the grand prize which has $27,000 in cash prizes and a $15,000 grand prize, and you get the cover of the magazine, which truly is life-changing. We've watched artists who get this level of publicity and this notoriety, and it really helps their careers. So anyway, that is happening uh, this month. You also have uh, two more days left to enter to win the Carl Dempwolf painting. This is a $6,000 painting from Carl. He made the frame, and you go to paintinggiveaway.com. It's only for the month of August, and so you want to make sure that you get entered for that uh, before, uh, and you only need to enter one time, so don't worry about that. Now, the other thing is that we have Realism Live. 
Realism Live is very much like our Plen Air Live, but this is dealing with realism. And when I say realism, it's the topics of painting realistic looking subjects, taking 3D items and making them 2D, but realism is what you can tell what it is, right? So in other words, it's not abstract. We have an incredible lineup of people who are going to be uh, either uh, doing speeches or, or talks. I like talks. I don't like speeches, but who are also going to be um, uh, demoing, teaching, giving concepts and so on. So look at the lineup. We've got some new people. Mark D'Alessio is, is going to be one of the finest landscape painters in the world. And he's coming to us live from, I, I'm not sure if it's Croatia, Serbia. I need to find that out. Tony Sir and I, uh, uh, absolutely incredible still life painting. I mean, look at that, the quality of that painting. Uh, Tony's going to be teaching. William Schneider is going to be teaching uh, uh, portraiture and, and, and uh, the figure. Connor Walton will be doing uh, something similar. Uh, Kathy Anderson will be teaching flowers. Uh, Kathy Odom is going to be doing landscapes. We really should be showing a landscape on that image. Jeff Legg is going to be teaching still life. Daniel Graves from the Florence Academy is going to be demoing and teaching uh, painting. Uh, also, Victoria Herrera is on the faculty. Daniel Gerhardt. I mean, this lineup is world class. Probably the only reason we can get this many great people together at this moment in time is because of coronavirus, because they're not as out there traveling and doing workshops like they used to. Juliet Aristides uh, is going to be teaching drawing. I mean, look at the quality of her drawing. Daniel Sprick is going to be teaching, and Rose France and Will as well. These are top, top names in the art world. Joshua Larocque uh, and, and then Graydon Parrish. Graydon's color, Munsell color mixing theories are absolutely incredible. We also have uh, Jean Stern is going to be speaking. Jean is an art historian. He's going to talk about the history of a particular area of art because we like to incorporate a little bit of history. So that's Realism Live, and uh, the price goes up on August 30th, which is tomorrow. So if you get in before midnight tomorrow night, Pacific time, uh, you will be able to save $100 on any of the categories. There's three categories, and each one has longer and longer replays plus some other perks, and the VIP category gets all kinds of goodie bags in the mail and, and just lots of fun stuff. And so uh, get signed up for that. Now, keep in mind that uh, if you were to go to our live conference, which uh, the Figurative Art Convention and Expo, if you were to go to that, which has been canceled, but if you were to go, you could fly across country, you could get a hotel room, get a rental car, uh, pay for your meals and your expenses, and you could very easily drop two, $3,000, including the cost of, of the event itself. And so this is going to be about one-tenth of that. If you get in uh, before tomorrow, before the end of tomorrow, you're going to get in, uh, and, and the beginner's day is even less. So if you want to just go to the beginner's day, a lot of people just go to that, and that is under $100. So uh, really a good opportunity just to see top people and teach you. But most of the beginners at the at Plenty Air Live ended up uh, signing up additionally because they wanted to watch the rest of it. And it's so good. And even if you can't make the dates, it's so good that you want to be able to watch the replays. So get in there and get that done. That's realismlive.com and uh, just go check it out. Okay, so today we have a fabulous guest with us. Thomas Kegler. Uh, Thomas is in upstate New York and actually in Aurora, New York. And uh, I had the privilege of visiting Thomas at his studio. Uh, as a matter of fact, Thomas kept our dogs. Uh, <laughs> Brady and I were driving home and uh, I think the dogs pooped in your house. I'm so sorry. Oh, about that. I don't even remember that. They're all good. <laughs> <laughs> but the... Uh, uh, anyway, I had a chance to see walls and walls and walls of paintings uh, there's an area on the stairway when you go up to Thomas's studio, which uh, he has done all of his family members. And is that right? It was all family yeah. members? Yeah. And, yeah. and I love that idea. And it's something I need to do is just to make sure I, you know, I get paintings of my mom and my dad and my brothers. And, you know, my mom's no longer living, but I have paintings mm -hmm. I've done of her, but not at the level that I can paint now. And, and of course, your level is about 3,000% higher than mine. So 
Uh, give give us a little background. You said you're a, you're an art teacher uh, mm -hmm. in the high high school system. Yep. Yeah, I'm a high school art teacher. I've been doing that for about 20 years, and uh, alongside that, my my other career is uh, painting. And I, I feel very blessed that I've been able to do both, and I think they work really well hand in hand. I, I really believe that being a teaching artist, uh, they complement each other. So being able to be able to articulate what is normally a very intuitive process, which is art making, um, ultimately will translate better on the canvas as well, because I find myself a lot of times really dissecting and thinking through the paint uh, mixtures as well as the passage that are actually going on the canvas. So yeah, it, it's, it's a wonderful um, uh, complementary career thing. I first learned about you because you were teaching at the Hudson River School Fellowship. Do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, yeah, that, that I would say was probably the most profound advancement in my knowledge of painting in, in every aspect because I'm, I'm very much self-taught. So the, the first year, I think it was 2008 that I get into the Hudson River Fellowship as a jury fellow, which was a miracle in itself uh, because of the, the, the level of skill in that, that group of 24 artists, which were from all over the world. And the wonderful part of the Hudson River Fellowship is that there's no curriculum. It's essentially a group of amazing artists getting together, going outside and painting, sometimes solo, sometimes in groups, and then coming back, bringing what you did, laying them out in a big hall, and essentially having like a three hour, very informal critique and seeing what everybody did. And, and it really, there was always this sort of um, unspoken, uh, but very healthy level of competition. And, but it was a, a give and take, nobody was, you know, guarding anything. So I made it a, a concerted effort to try to paint with someone new every day and learn from them and, you know, as far as materials or the way they looked at things. And these people were, and still are amazing painters. And they were bringing in aspects of ateliers from all over the world, you know, whether it was Japan or Europe or America, uh, New Zealand, uh, all these different countries that these artists came from. So they were bringing in materials and knowledge. And, and I was exposed to artists I'd never heard of before. So that really, and, and now the actual painting, we were painting pretty much seven days a week, sun up to sundown, including rain or shine. And uh, it was very, very prolific. We we're, were producing just a lot of work. We started out just doing drawings for about a week. And then we went into Grisaille and, and monochromatic studies and then eventually into full color. And it really is a way to, to emulate what they were doing back in the Hudson River time. And Jacob Collins, who founded it, um, that's what he was trying to emulate. It was also a compliment to what he was doing at his Water Street Atelier um, at, at that time. And, it, and it's really, it complemented what he was doing during, you know, essentially the school year, and it, which was portraiture and still life. And this augmented it with exposure outside, which was very challenging. Yeah, I, I have been absolutely blown away by the quality of the work that was coming yeah. out of that, that fellowship. <clears throat> One of the aspects that you talked about, which I think is so important, is that that uh, many of us have a particular atelier or teacher or someone that we've studied with. And oftentimes we're sticking with that only. And, you know, we're, we're kind of approaching things with blinders, you know, and, and there are a thousand different approaches, probably a hundred thousand different approaches to things. And that's one of the reasons we created the, the face conference originally is because people would come from, a, you know, a student of, a former student or student from one of the ateliers would come and see uh, someone else teach from another atelier and they would pick up ideas and concepts and it would expand their thinking and expand their ideas. The same is true for watching videos or watching these segments uh, every day, because even if you're, let's say you're a, a watercolor painter, watching an oil painter is going to inform your watercolor. Absolutely. Vice, vice versa. Absolutely. So I, I want to talk just briefly about a couple of things. First off, um, I, I wanted to just go back to this briefly. This is an eight-foot painting that Thomas did, and he did a video for us, which is called Painting Niagara. And uh, that is available at lilyartvideo.com. Uh, I'll probably put that on the screen later. But uh, it's really a start to finish and, and took several weeks to, to accomplish this and or several months i guess and uh it's absolutely fabulous to really get that level of instruction and and today we're going to talk about painting mist and water uh but i also wanted to tell everybody about this new book that you've done uh it's called the spirit in the brush and it's painting uh devotionals if 
by Thomas Kegler. And Thomas uh, gifted me a couple of copies of the book, including one of the uh, the signed ones that had a a, uh, uh, a drawing with it in the, in a special box. Uh, Thomas, uh, mm-hmm. why don't you just see? Let's see if I can find this video clip. Um, why don't you talk about this book real quickly? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. And by the way, thank you, Eric, for writing one of the forwards in it. Um, it's such a fine job, and I appreciate that. It was a real compliment. Um, yeah, th- this book is a compilation of my paintings uh, set in a 365-day devotional book. So essentially, each day of the year has a devotion. Uh, there's about 120 paintings total. And, and for each painting, there is a biblical verse for each day. So each painting has about three days of, of reads. And this is essentially a uh, dedication to my late wife. And during her journey, she was uh, doing a lot of daily readings um, and daily devotionals in the Bible. And this really evolved from that. And it's a way of me celebrating her life and and the legacy she's left, but also um, a way of uh, hopefully using my paintings to encourage people to look upward. So they can get that at thomaskegler.com slash book, right? Thomas Yes, Kegler. yes, yes. So it's available on my website um, and yeah. I self-published it. So uh, at this current time, it's the only place to um, to acquire it, um, but we may explore some other options in the future. If someone would put that in the comments, that would be very helpful. thomaskegler.com slash book. All right. So thank you for that. I, I, I mm-hmm. love mine and I love the devotionals. I, I find it very helpful. And so... Um, well, let's talk about what we're going to do today. You tell me what sure. you want me to pull up. Do you want me to pull up the image of the geyser, the video of the geyser? Um, you... Actually, why don't we start? Well, sure, you can bring that up and then we can come back to it because I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about okay. what is inspiring on it. So uh, recently, my, my kids and I went out to Yellowstone and um, I now at this point realize why all the Hudson River grates uh, would obviously be painting out east, you know, around the Adirondacks. But I also always saw a few of these Yellowstone paintings. And once I went out there, I understood why the landscape out there is absolutely stunning. And with the current situation of COVID, uh, my kids and I were able to um, do a very quick uh, plan of a trip. Uh, We stayed with a good friend, Tim Newton, um, out in Cody. And that was kind of our hub. And from there, we explored Yellowstone. And we got a cabin uh, right next to Old Faithful and out outside our door look out and there it was every hour and a half going off. So I, I came back with lots of sketches. And if you want to bring those up, I can then talk about a little bit of a process. Uh, yeah. One of those uh, images, yep, that one there shows a, a few little thumbnails. Now these, they look pretty small. They're about an inch by two inches, give or take. And I, I use tone paper and uh, a little bit of graphite, usually just one pencil and then white accenting. Now the beauty of this process is each one of those sketches takes a grand total of literally maybe three minutes each. So on the fly, uh, in an hour, I can get several pages of concepts in one location. And I don't have to worry about color. I don't have to worry about details. It's about these big relationships of of value and masses and composition. Um, Then typically what I'll do, if you want to now scroll through the other, those three sketches close up, you can kind of get an idea how they look. And then um, a lot of times on site, I'll do an ink wash drawing, like the next one coming up. So these typically take me an hour or two, and it's a chance for me now to sit down in front of the subject and really get to know it a little bit more intimately. Again, without worrying about the distractions of color. I think a lot of times artists, including myself, get too caught up in trying to analyze color on the spot. And I do think it's an important thing, but uh, color is subordinate to composition and value. They are definitely the most important thing in a compelling painting. So this is a way I typically gather reference. If I'm at a place in an extended stay uh, and I have a block of time to actually sit down and do oil paintings, I definitely would do that. But honestly, the time I spent with the Hudson River Fellowship and doing oil paintings outside for several summers, probably five summers straight, um, doing oil paintings outside, I've really acquired an, an invaluable knowledge of the phenomena I see out there and the nuances of color and in many ways they become ingrained. So there's no shortcuts. If you're going to be doing studio paintings or plein air, uh, you have to put the miles in to really start to understand color and and all those nuances that I just mentioned. 
and I'm still learning it. It's a, it's a, a never ending endeavor. And that's, that's part of the process. So you're going to so, pay, you're going to paint for us today. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did when I got back is I developed a, a few underpaintings knowing that I would probably do this for the demo and it would tie in with the video, which is obviously a much more expanded explanation of some of these processes. Um, and I, I always say that my process is definitely not the only one. It's not the best one. It just works for me. And it's always changing. My materials change, my processes change. And uh, that's what I love about oil painting is it's a constant challenge and, and it's always encouraging me to grow in my, in my process. So I, I think I'll just kind of pan over to show you where I'm at with a couple of studies. This is the one I'm going to develop a little further. It's uh, I work in layers. So this is, I would say layer two, the first layer, I'm just going to grab another painting. Uh, typically what I do for the first layer is something like that, which is uh, grisaille. Now, sometimes I'll do these grisailles in earth tones like umbers. And in this particular case, it is simply a, um, a black and white. And, and I let them work. Is that done in oil? This is oil, yeah. So this will eventually be glazed up in a series of layers. And by the way, these are really great to do on site as well because, again, you're worrying about a strong composition, you're not worrying about color. And I'd like to have a lot of freedom with my color because I believe that's the voice of emotion. And that's that's something I like to have that artistic liberty um, in the studio itself. On site, I try to capture, if I'm doing an old painting, I try to capture as accurately as I can because that instills the understanding. But once the understanding is there, um, I believe it's important to then influx the, the artistic discretion for creating an emotion or mood in the studio. I want to ask you a question about that real quickly. Sure. <clears throat> um, so your plein air painting in grisaille, are you ever plein air painting where you're actually laying down color and impasto or are you doing everything with glazing? So in the field, if I'm doing a full process, um, even in the field, I'm doing a layer process. And, and typically, I'm sorry, I'm not talking to camera. Let me just turn this so I'm speaking with people. Uh, in the field, I even when I do my workshops, which are plein air, I typically will do a demonstration in the morning that may take two or three hours. And it is a layered process. Mind you, I can't let the underpainting dry completely. It's just the nature of oil paint. But I always will start with an imprimatur, which is staining the canvas with a brown or raw umber. I'll then do a grisaille. And then while that is sort of- Wait, wait, wait. Up, what's, the, what's the difference between imature immature and, and grisaille? So the imprimatur is simply staining the canvas. It's taking away the starkness of the white. It sets down a warm undertone. It's usually a raw umber. Every saw, artist has their own. Okay. So toning the canvas. Exactly. So the tone right. is the imprimatur. The next oh. stage, which is the crassai, which is, it's an old term meaning gray painting. That could technically be gray. It could be black and white, but a lot of artists will use white with raw umber. And then while that, I cut that with mineral spirits. So that's actually setting and drying um, in the field while I then take time and pre-mix the colors I see before me. And then typically that'll take a half an hour. By the time that's the, the underpainting and the grisaille is more or less set, I've mixed my colors and then I can start applying that on top of that underpainting. So in the field, I can often get three or four layers, but I have to be careful that I don't scrub too hard because obviously that would uh, reactivate the under layers and, and create the mud. We always Let me ask you a question, yeah. a question about that because yesterday we had, um, <clears throat> oh, I, I'm blanking out now who did we we had Amory bowling on yesterday mm -hmm. and she does all, all these grand, grand canyon pieces and she also mm -hmm. does a lot of glazing but she lays down her underpainting in acrylic yeah what you, that's a great idea it's a great idea that yeah. way she's not dealing with with everything drying yeah and they, that they're completely compatible as long as you use that acrylic as the, as the any kind of water base underneath the oil yeah right. yeah that's a great idea okay. Okay. um so yeah, right. so as, as far as my process, that's that's more or less it in a nutshell. And it obviously is a very brief explanation, but um, if you have questions on that, obviously I can answer that or the video really gets yeah. into it. Yes, and, and, and people can get, they can also uh, ask questions in the comments and I'll try to field them to you yeah. as you're you're getting your, your demo going here. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so back to this, I, I talked a little bit about the process. So this was a, a concepted piece. It started with a concepted thumbnail based on what I saw. And I, I started with a black and white underpainting. Now, uh, this one's a little more developed. This is a more of a, a bright daytime scene. And this is a sunset where it's kind of sort of backlit. 
And um, this one's, not, I would say, maybe 80% done. I got a, a few more uh, developments to do on it, but we'll do that after this layer dries because this is still wet from this morning. Now, this one is, um, is, I would say, on the second stage as well. The background is mostly developed, and I left the, the mist to be developed for the demonstration, and, and I'll talk about a little bit how I'll pull that through. So, so, so just one for clarification for everybody, sure. uh, you toned your canvas with a raw umber. Yep. And then you did your painting in in gray. Yeah. So it would have been something like this. Something like that. And then now you're gonna now you're staining on top of that. So you're the reason you're getting that that brilliant light in the sun is because you're using a thin transparent. Blade. Correct. So to make something bright in the layered process, like if you're referring to these areas, usually what I do is I'll put that in as a pure white. And then once that the white is set over a day or two, then I'll glaze on top of that, which is a transparent suspended pigment, um, glaze on top of that a warm color. And it creates this luminosity that you really can't get by simply mixing that color with white. And that's one of the beauties of oil paint. Okay. And, and it works really well. And so, what you, when you're glazing, uh, what do you mix into your paint? You're putting a linseed oil or a medium? Uh, yeah, I use a medium. Um, there's a lot of different ones you can use. I, I really like Natural Pigments Oleo Gel. Yeah. And I'm just going to pick a little bit up with my with my uh, pellet knife here. It's, it's a basically a, I'm getting near the camera, it's a clear gel. And you can use oleo gel. I also like the non-toxic walnut water-washed gel. That's actually what I currently use. So I'm trying to go a little more non-toxic in the studio these days. And, and that's makes, essentially how you do the the uh, the glazing mix. Who makes that? The water base I get from our tree house. The water base, it's a water-washed walnut gel. And I've been using that for a couple of years along with the oil gel, and I really like them both. Okay. All right, so um, let's get started. You've got about, oh, we got about 18 minutes or so. All right, sounds good. So if you could bring up the video of Old Faithful again, that's handy. Okay, well, you're asking a lot. Ah, yeah. If you can, it's fine. Okay, wait a minute. I uh, got the wrong one. Okay, this. Yeah, yeah. So right. when I'm in the field, water movement is quite a phenomenon in physics. And back to the Hudson River Fellowship, one of the beautiful aspects of the fellowship was that Jacob Collins, as, a, as an accent to our painting, would bring in professional speakers, but they weren't artists. He would bring in geologists, meteorologists, physicists, and one of them was a specialist in water. Um, and that really opened my eyes to un not just paint what I saw, but understand it before I painted it. And understanding movement of water is just so important, whether it's a subtle stream or, in Niagara's case, a, a torrent. In this case, we have rising mist. So understanding what's making it rise and what happens in the air and then when it actually falls is all part of, of the painting process. So I often will sit there and just stare at something like this for a long time and try to follow the clouds with my eyes and follow what's actually happening as it's rising and then eventually falling and what's causing it to rise. So if you notice this, as Old Faithful is just thinking about doing its magnificent spout, it's, it, obviously this is not its full uh, height, uh, what's happening is the water underneath the ground is boiling and essentially starting to create get to the point where it can't contain it anymore. And when it first comes out, it's coming out as essentially like a stream from a hose. And once it gets to its apex, it pauses in air. And there's this unique phenomenon with water where it's attracted to itself. So it basically finds particles of water next to it and it binds with it and becomes essentially a chunk of water, for lack of better terms and it will fall. Now, all around that, you also have heated water, uh, which is suspended, and that's actually rising. So you have this, this rise, fall, rise, fall going on and different things causing that, and whether that is from the force or the heat. Then within that, you've got light interacting with it. Now, in this case, we have a left lighting coming from it, coming from the essentially the south. This is about five o'clock in the afternoon. And so you'll see that it's, it's heavily lit with the particles on the left side. And then we see shadow forms, depending on the thickness and density of the water on the right of those clouds. And then eventually, as it starts to fall, it gets thinner again. So during all this, I am asking myself, you know, why I'm seeing this and, and what's causing all these, these variations in value. 
Now, water, when it's suspended, is transparent. So within that, we also see aspects of the landmass, which is behind it. So those, those are the things I'm looking for. Now, obviously, this changes. Like, the, the sun could, at this point, go behind a cloud. And that's going to change all those relationships. So I have to sort of decide on what I'm trying to capture and go with it so that even if those, those aspects change. And that's kind of one of those things about taking a video is it allows me to revisit it slow it down and really study what's happening in air uh, in this case with with old faithful so what i do now is just translate that back down into my palette and we'll just start mixing some colors that i think i'm going to need for this so do you want to tell, do you want to tell us your typical palette please uh, I, i've got a lot of colors and it changes with the painting i let the painting really dictate what is going to be happening on the mixture so in this particular case uh, I, I typically will lay them out in spectral order. I go from my warms to my cools. So I've got a series, uh, and it changes all the time. That's why I'm always hesitant when somebody says, what color did you use to mix that? I'm always hesitant because it doesn't really matter. All that really matters is if the value is right and if the temperature is right. So I, I don't get caught up in recipes a whole lot, but I, I'll, I'll give you what I have. Uh, I essentially have uh, transparent red oxide, alizarin crimson, cad orange, cad yellow, uh, I put a green in here, although I probably won't use it. It's a cobalt green by Williamsburg, which I really like. Prussian blue. Um, I have a ultramarine blue. This is radiant blue with, I believe that's gambling. And this is a violet. So. And what kind of white do you use? I, oh, I love lead white, but again, I'm trying to get away from using toxic. So at this point, I am using the Winsor Newton Griffin Alkid white, which is a titanium. And I really like that. Uh, it sets really nicely and it, it mixes really nice. So uh, it's it's certainly not up to the working characteristics of lead weight, but uh, I'm actually real happy with it. Yeah. So as far as mixing goes, most of my background is done. So I really want to focus on what's happening with the clouds. So in this case, it's a, it's a sunset scene, which is different than the video that you were just looking at, which was the looping video of Old Faithful. So a lot of this is going to be concepted through so typically what I'll do is I'll start with a few piles of white and I will basically make several temperatures of grays. So I'll just make a few piles and this will vary once I actually get underway too. You'll also see me pick it up and I'll go off screen because I'm actually comparing it on the painting to check its value relationship. So I think the first thing we'll do is just make a straight up ultramarine and white together to get a nice cool blue, which is sort of the dominant color cast that I'm seeing there. Now, this is really powerful. When I hold it up there, it's glowing. So I may use a little bit of that chroma, which is just intense color when I say chroma, but I want to take that down a notch. Now, I can gray that down a few different ways. I can actually mix black with it, or I can mix this complement, which would be some variation of orange. Really, either one will work. You know, if I take a little bit of orange into this, it's going to kill it. it. Takes away that harshness. And again, I'm not sure how this is translating on the screen, but that makes a really nice um, slightly more neutral, cool gray. And when I hold it up to my painting, it's pretty spot on. So I'm going to put that in a separate pile. I'll keep a little bit of that chromatic uh, blue as an accent within that. So this is sort of the dominant color that I'm seeing. And that's always usually how I, I start my painting is to, to, what I would say, mix what I would call the blur. So if you were to take a photograph of that particular scene and blur it in Photoshop, it gets rid of accents like chromatic or light notes or dark notes and makes it all kind of one and that's sort of the first thing i'll mix the next thing i would do is mix variations of the darker notes and then variations of the lighter notes which always vary a little bit so in this case uh, i'll mix a little larger batch of that same thing so again ultramarine blue whoops picked up i think it's the right one okay ultramarine blue and then a little bit of orange to knock it down check my value i want this a little bit darker and then again, a little bit of that orange to pull it in. Um, that didn't quite pull it in enough. So I, I will just use what I often do is just black to pull it down too. So it's maybe hard to tell. It's just very slightly darker. Again, I'm not sure how the camera screen is going to pick up those little subtleties. Picking it up pretty well. Okay, cool. I'm going to go one more darker and this time I'm going to pull in a little bit of a Payne's gray which I like to use sometimes 
which cools it down. So I've really got three variations for that mist in this area. Now there is obviously some lighter areas where it's backlit, it's being backlit by a warm sun. So those particles of suspended water are being back illuminated. So I can actually just go ahead and pull in orange, which is just cat orange and white. Now this value is gonna be way too light, but if I put it on thinly, especially if I mix it with a transparent carrier, it should translate just right and still let some of that underpainting show through. Okay. You got about 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. And then the other thing is I noticed that this radiant blue right out of the tube really works nicely for my cooler areas. Now, in the end, I probably would have several more variations of this, but I, you know, it's for a quick demo that shows you at least my thought process. Now, if we come back up to the painting, I'll get working on applying some of that and talking about some of the phenomena. Well, what I'll do is I'll start with some of the actual spout and then work where we may over to the areas where we've got some mist going on. Sorry, so where are, I'm putting, are you going to be painting mostly glaze at this point? Or are you going to be painting? So it, it, at this point, well, it comes to the, you know, get me into another conversation. The definition of a glaze typically is a transparent dark put over a light. Ah. The sister process is called scumbling. So scumbling is an opaque light put over a dark. Right. And they work hand in hand. So for instance, if I were to put this color here, thinly on top of this, it's a glaze because it's darker. Take that exact same color and put it over here. Now it's lighter than the background. Now it's a scumble, <laughs> exact same mixture. Okay. So it's it's a tough one to answer when, when you All ask right. that. Does that make sense? I've never heard that, but thank you, yes. Okay, so to answer your question, am I doing a glaze or a scumble? It depends where I put it in this particular painting. All right, so I'm just gonna start by, by placing some uprise here. Now, as it's rising up, it comes out as a shoot and then it pauses in air, depending on the pressure. So if there's a pause in air, I'm just gonna go ahead and put like a little half moon here. You get these little pauses like this. <coughs> Again, I don't know how well it's picking up. And a lot of times I'll put those little half moons in and then I take a little rubber tip brush and I use that to come in and almost create these little motion blurs and, and sort of activate the illusion of that motion within that paint passage. So these rubber tip brushes work really well for this process of painting moving water. Now notice over here that that's a scumble because it's a lighter blue note on top of a darker. Now, as soon as I put it over here, initially, it, you know, you could call this just an opaque passage, but as soon as I do something to make it transparent, so now by pulling that, I'm, I'm adding to the illusion of transparency and technically that becomes a glaze in this area with the exact same mixture. So I can explore this phenomenon of these sort of eye shoots, these, these, these offshoots here, not eye shoots, um, coming over here to, to fool the eye into making this look like spouting water pausing in air. And again, this underpainting is pretty much dry, so it allows me to do that. And the other thing I should mention that I, that I didn't cover is that before I do scumbling or glazing on a dry painting, I typically will put down what's called a couch or a couche, depends on how you translate it, which is essentially rubbing the surface with a little bit of the carrier of the medium, in this case, the walnut gel, and then wiping it off. So it basically prepares the surface to accept that scumble or glaze. All right, so the next thing I'll do is work into some of the darker areas, which where the, the, the water is thickest, and it could be off to the side here in the center. I'll get some of the, these darker areas. And it's subtle, might be hard to pick up on screen. And maybe so over in here, the beauty of clouds, or in this case, mist, which is essentially the same thing, is that it gives you so much artistic liberty to work with your composition because they're constantly morphing. You have discretion. I'm just using a soft brush now to sort of manipulate those passages. 
um, you can intentionally completely manipulate your composition because of that constant movement. That's why I love painting this so much. So all I'm doing is getting these more intense shadow or basically a shadow area in suspended water is uh, a higher density. It's just thicker water, essentially, or more of it. Now down in here, I might pull in some more lighter notes. Notice that I, I love to put the paint on and then manipulate it. And whether that's with a rubber tip brush or a dry brush. And this, this creates that illusion of mist because it's really moving that paint around and allowing the underpaintings to still work with it. And over in, I'll just work that. So this is where the mist is still rising. But we also have a phenomena as it's rising, it starts to cool. And then over in this area, you're going to have some of that start to drop. So I can create some of that going on as well. And then over in here, what we have is basically the water that's shooting up is landing on the ground and running down on here, but it's still really hot. So now you've got all this boiling water running down and evaporating. And again, the beauty of all this dancing of vapors from an artistic standpoint is you just have so much to so much freedom to work with that. And again, I'm just manipulating that with a soft brush once it's on there, creating these veils of suspended water. And just trying to mimic what I'm seeing there. So you got about three minutes. All right. So <laughs> this, you know, this is actually a really complicated thing to explain in a short amount of time, but I'm hoping that at least gives you some kind of idea of the approach. Now, you know, the beauty of this, again, is you have that complete artistic liberty of using the mist compositionally. You can create accents wherever you want them. So for instance, you know, in my mind, I, I, I love all the dancing in the mist, but I really want you looking over here. So in that case, what I can do is to use my palette knife because your eyes attracted to thick paint as well as contrast. You'll notice that right now my highest contrast I want right here. That's where I want you looking. I'll put in a very bright, warm note with the palette knife. It's very small, but it's an eye catcher. And that's being put right next to the darkest note. Everything else is sort of downplayed in terms of soft edges, soft transitions of values. But you as an artist have that complete control to tell us where to look by simply controlling those little art elements such as contrast, value, chroma. So <coughs> how are we doing that time? Well, we probably should start wrapping up. All right, cool. Transition back over to me. Okay. All right. Well, that, that was fabulous. I, I, I could watch that for hours. So that's all outlined, not in geyser form, but in waterfall form. It's, it's all about, you know, atmosphere and, and, and water essentially. Suspended. Yeah. So where, where you show where you did this eight foot painting and uh, it's called Niagara and it's a, it's a phenomenal piece of work. I mean, Thank absolutely you. incredible uh, what you went through and to show all the the stages of development of the drawings and the studies and all the pieces to do that. It, it is a phenomenon. So uh, I'll, I'll put on, on screen and you guys, if you, if you're interested in that, um, you just, uh, just, just uh, go to lilyartvideo.com and search Thomas Kegler and you can find uh, that video. Tom, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much. I really enjoy it. I love doing the demo. So thank you so much for bringing me on there. Okay, get a day off. Come up to the Adirondacks. We'll go painting. I'm hoping to make that happen in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. All right. All right. Well, that was Thomas Kegler, and that was absolutely fantastic. Um, man, I could watch that for hours, hours. Absolutely. I learned a lot of things right there. Uh, the rubber tip brush thing was, uh, I have one of those rubber tip brushes, but I tend to use it to pull paint off if I make a mistake, but I'm going to start using it that way. So that was really wonderful. Okay, just a couple of reminders uh, for you. Uh, first off, I completely forgot to mention 
uh, winners the last day. So we give away prizes every day for comments, right? Uh, we grab somebody randomly out of the comments. And so yesterday's winner of the easel brush clip, which uh, clips onto your easel, clips onto your easel like this, and then you just grab your brushes and put them in and out. The winner of the easel brush clip is Rachel Dowd from Ohio. I forgot to do that yesterday. Uh, I, and I forgot to announce yesterday that I'm giving away today um, my book. Uh, so I, actually, I guess it's today I'm announcing it. I'm giving away my book, Make More Money Selling Your Art uh, by me. Um, and so, uh, you can leave comments and you have a chance to win the book. If you are outside of the U S uh, you can have a digital copy if you prefer, so you can get it quicker. Uh, reminder today's 3 PM video, Mario Robinson, beginner watercolor, and you can find it on YouTube or Facebook by searching streamline art video. Uh, you have until the 31st to give a, uh, to enter, to win the, Carl Dempel, $6,000 painting at paintinggiveaway.com. Uh, we also have the Plen Air Salon ending on the 31st, and you want to get your entry in. Uh, you don't have to have fresh paintings. Most competitions say they got to be fresh. I don't know why they do that. Good paintings are good paintings, and they need to be highlighted. And so get your paintings entered for Plen Air Salon by the 31st. And last but not least, uh, the... Realism Live, the price increases tomorrow, not the 31st, but the 30th at 12 midnight Pacific time. And get that done. Uh, we put it on the 30th for two reasons. It's my birthday. Secondly, uh, we had so many other things deadlining on the 31st. We wanted to make it stand out. And I don't know what the count is. Last I heard, we we're close to 800. We're probably going to end up capping it out at, I don't know, however many we have. It, we, it's going to depend on how much we have technology issues, and so we can serve a large number, but we have to uh, uh, get that done in advance, a couple of weeks in advance, so that we can buy the extra equipment to serve the extra technology. So uh, we will, at some point, we'll cut off attendance, and so I'm not sure what that point was. We cut off uh, Plein Air Live at 1500, and so I don't know what we're going to cut this one off yet. We'll know that soon. Also, uh, we have the artist and selfie competition. If you remember at the beginning of all this COVID stuff, I asked everybody to do self-portraits. We're doing a competition. We've extended the deadline on that because we're going to present it at the Figurative Art Convention next year. But go ahead and get your selfies and your uh, paintings of other artists, your paintings of art studios, and paintings of artists doing plein air paintings. Uh, get those in and enter them at artistandselfie.com. All right. You can follow me, Eric Rhodes, at Instagram and Facebook. Uh, spell it with an A, R-H-O-A-D-S. All right. Uh, remember, Thomas Kegler's uh, video is at lilyartvideo.com. And you'll also find Mario Robinson's at lilyartvideo.com. So, and you can get Thomas Kegler's book, the devotional book, uh, at Thomas Kegler dot com slash book. I love doing this every day for you. I love communicating and 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 being there for you. I want you to keep your head in the right place. Don't spend so much time absorbing. You can watch, but don't absorb the negativity that's out there. You've got to keep your head in the right place. Stay positive. Stay upbeat. Do something you love. I love painting. I I like a lot of you. I know a lot of you like to do painting or want to learn painting. This is a great way to do it every day at three o'clock and every day at noon. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazines. Thank you for watching. I will see you tomorrow on day number 158. Bye-bye.